Yes. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, I am Betsy Fisher Martin, and I'm on the faculty at American University, where I'm the executive director of the Women in Politics Institute. Hence, the topic of our panel this morning, all about uh, women voters. Um, you know, on approach to the centennial of suffrage. Um, post the year of the woman in 2018. So a lot to talk about this morning. Um, I want to start with my favorite pollster, Joel Benenson. Joel, <laughs> tell us please. I said favorite. Um, what do we know right now, given that obviously not all women vote alike, but what do we know as a pollster when you think about women voters, what do we know right now about what they care about the most um, as we approach 2020? Well, thank you, uh, NYU. Thank you, Betsy. Um, I think that, you know, there's no question that women um, turned out in force in the midterm elections in a very different way. Uh, but not necessarily around a very different set of issues. Women um, have been, um, in my view, as opposed to more future focused, uh, more focused on the next generation. What that means is that women tend to be uh, more concerned about issues around common sense gun laws, uh, around climate change, uh, but also around economic issues. Women are very in tune today um, to the uh, disadvantages they face in the workplace, obviously, which are being uh, I don't want to say neglected, but they're being exacerbated. Um, and women are uh, kind of the keepers of the family. And so when we talk about the future and we talk about the next generation, it's not just about women. Uh, they place a lot more concern about what is life going to be like for their children. So uh, their attitudes on issues around guns, for example, and common sense gun laws are more intense and more intensely held than it is among men, including among Republican women, where you get about half of Republican women who say they uh, value uh, uh, placing a great importance on common sense gun laws and dealing with climate change. So it's it's approach that goes beyond the immediacy, but then there's something, and we had the great benefit of uh, doing a poll for the uh, uh, at American University Institute for Women in Politics, uh, which happens to be headed by Betsy Fisher Martin. Uh, it's amazing who, how that works, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, but one interesting thing as we think about women in vote, voting, um, a, a very strong majority of women, overwhelming majority of women on all ideological sides, believe that we need to have more women in elective office but they won't vote for women just because they're women. They have to be women who are in touch with the issues and the values that they care about. And so I think we did see a kind of wave of, of women participation uh, in 2018, even versus 2016, in a presidential year uh, that did favor Democrats in that midterm election around a, a suite of issues. Because the last piece of it is, and I can't speak for uh, all women on this issue, I can only talk about the, the polling data. Um, but women, including half of Republican women, a clear majority of women and half of Republican women, when they're asked about Trump, dislike Trump for both his policies and his tone. And the tone of politics today can be very alienating to women. And candidates who uh, don't uh, display some uh, modicum of awareness of that and sensitivity to that and I think modulate the tone of politics today are going to lose ground with women across the ideological spectrum. Great. Thanks, Joel. Um, so, Rob and Elise, I want to ask you, um, as we think about Trump a little bit more that Joel alluded to, a lot of times we've heard the president say that he won women. It's, uh, that's not true. He did not win women in 2016. Hillary Clinton won women 54 to 41. But what he did win was white women, 52 to 43. Um, white college graduates, Clinton 51, Trump 44. White non-college graduates, Trump 61, Clinton 34. So um, as we look at 2020, um, how does the president um, hold on to that white non-college female vote? That seems to be the Democrats are trying to go after now because that's where they can pick up. Um, as you think about, Joel mentioned that, you know, the strong dislike among women for Trump's tone and his rhetoric, um, which doesn't seem to be subsiding at all. So how does he kind of hold the line on sort of that white non-college educated women um, 
as he looks at the map for 2020? Well, there's actually a really good story in the Times yeah. today oh, about, wow. <laughs> about just that, about uh, the Trump campaign's effort to expand yeah. among non-college educated mm -hmm. white women. And they're going to try to, you know, tap that hidden base. Kellyanne talked about that a lot in 2016. <clears throat> yeah. Trying to mobilize women, uh, you know, using uh, Mrs. Pence in Minnesota. They're trying to make inroads in Minnesota. But I, the only way that I see for Trump to keep his support among that critical element of women, because otherwise, like, he really is doomed. Right. If he, if he cannot hold uh, non-college educated white women, is to keep playing up the culture war rhetoric, the us against them. That's going mm -hmm. to be more divisive. You look at the difference between just suburban women and how they view the NRA and yeah. rural women, and so he's going to have to keep just amplifying those divides. Yeah, I, I'd agree with a lot of that. Yeah. I think um, all presidents are uniquely tied to the economy. He's even more so. Um, and I think the, um, the argument is going to have to be um, a contrast of here's what uh, the, the, the Democrats are offering in their national nominee. And... Um, the challenges that, um, the, that his, I guess what I would say is the campaign right now is defined largely by him and his governing. And um, I think Trump would say, and he says it many times, he's better when he has an opponent, an identified opponent. He says he's a great counterpuncher, and I think that's yeah. probably what's going to, he's going to have to set up a contrast. And um, like his previous election, it, it will be a choice of the lesser of two evils, is my guess, to that voting population you're track talking about. But it seems to be in, in some of the recent polls that we see that that <coughs> subset of women, the white non-college educated women, um, responding to his, not responding positively to his rhetoric and his tone, um, what he says, especially around immigration and, um, uh, you know, that negativity and that rhetoric that those women seem to be moving a little bit away from him because of that. Those numbers have softened since August yeah. across the board. So you're seeing whether it's a presidential doldrum or you have uh, a number of debates and candidates and conversation that have a tendency to, you know, say what you want about what the Democrats are saying about each other. They're unified in their critique of the administration. Um, you know, the economy looks like it's softening. We're not sure. Yeah. Um, some say it is, some say it is. But, uh, you know, missteps in foreign policy. Yeah. Trade wars are, have gone on longer than I think people had expected. Right. And people are just getting restless. And the Republicans yeah. are getting restless. I mean, you saw Mitch McConnell putting an op-ed in the paper attacking Trump. I mean, so there's there's just a sense of um, rest in that. Wait, wait, can he shake it off? I mean, mm -hmm. could, could you know Trump be down 10 points on Columbus Day and win? Yeah, I mean, he's a unique candidate that he can change the dialogue. He can change the conversation so fast. Right. It's hard to count him out. But, um, I mean, I think... If you talk to you know campaigns across the party spectrum, they're all seeing a softening in the numbers mm -hmm. that um, has occurred in the last six weeks that they're pretty anxious about. I think it's pretty early right now. We don't have a lot of candidates. We're kind of right. in the primaries. Republicans, the base is kind of always restless and um, has been since 2006. Mm -hmm. And it's it's been better under Trump, but it doesn't mean that they're, you know, Tills is going to get a primary you know, in North Carolina. Um, <laughs> you know, you're just seeing, you know, that kind of churn, which is, so I'm not too worried about it right now, but I think, um, you know, there, we have to get through the Christmas season, I think, get through impeachment, and then we'll know better where we are. Mm -hmm. Can I throw in one yeah. last data yeah. point on the other side of the uh, education uh, perspective, which is yeah. white college-educated women in 2016 in the presidential election with Hillary Clinton on the ballot? Um, Democrats, Hillary won white college women by 11 points in the midterms where we had almost, we had historic 100 year turnout. Uh, Democrats won white college women by 19 points. Yeah. So you've got two sides of this package and if we break it down just by non-college and college, we're missing a bigger picture, which there was a pretty big shift among college educated women. And that's something I was thinking about just in terms of this conference. Yeah. When we all gathered you know, two years ago, right after 2016, and we kind of felt the beginning of a political realignment, but now everyone, it just, we're talking about it, it's happened. Right. College educated women 
in large part have abandoned the Republican Party, and will they ever be able to get those women back? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I think Definitely. one of the things that, um, you know, when the Women's March happened in January of 2017, I think there was a question of, okay, what is, what will this lead to? Yeah. You know, is this just going to be a moment and with nothing to follow? And I think what we saw after that was um, more women get, not only get involved in politics, but run for office. Yeah. And um, we would not have, Democrats would not have won the majority unless we, unless, it, without the, without our women candidates. Mm -hmm. And they all, and, and they crossed the spectrum in terms of experience. I mean, you had a number of, you had a number of women who had national security backgrounds, right. who had uh, business backgrounds, who were. Who had very who had very interesting backgrounds that fit their district, and yeah. um, and I think the you know another uh, another phenomenon I think that is really a, a very positive development in politics that we're seeing is if you look at the top four candidates running for office for president right now, all four of them have women communications directors: mm -hmm. um, Joe Biden, Kate Bedingfield. Um, uh, you have uh, Elizabeth Warren, um, who has Kristen Orthman. Uh, you have uh, Pete Buttigieg, who has Liz Smith. Yeah. And um, I'm missing one other. Uh, oh, uh, Lily. Lily Adams Lily. With, um, yeah. with Kamala Harris. Right. That, 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 is, that, that is a relatively <clears throat> new development. I mean, you know, you, you know, you have pioneers like Kiki McLean, who were in very senior positions on presidential campaigns, um, but at that level, right. you really haven't seen that type of diversity. Um, and you know, I think the and I think that makes a huge difference in terms of how these candidates shape their message, yeah. Yeah. how they campaign for votes, um, and they're also all millennials, which is. Another, I think, really yeah. interesting aspect of yeah. the other the other thing that is like you've got you've yeah. got two um, the two the two committee chairs for the first time are women uh, Cortez Masto and Sherry Bustos never happened before. Well, and we have you know four women now on the debate stage, six women that had run mm -hmm. for president too, which yep. is significant and yep. uh, history making in and of itself. Yeah, and I think this question of whether or not a woman can take on Trump. Yeah. <laughs> We're watching every day Speaker Pelosi outmaneuver Trump. And of all of his political rivals, um, he hasn't figured her out. He is intimidated by her. Um, he, uh, you know, he hasn't come up with a nickname for her. He, he just, I, I, I think he is still, I don't think he ever will, but he, she has, um, I think, laid a roadmap to how you take him on and beat him. Yeah. And um, it's been really fascinating to watch. I was in House leadership when she did her first turn as Speaker, and just watching her operate, I mean, meetings with Speaker Pelosi are just fascinating because you know everything has been set up beforehand. Like, there's been two or three meetings before the meeting that she's in, and then she sets everything up. And it's just fascinating to watch. She has a female chief of staff. That's right. She has a female communications director, yeah. Ashley Eddian. Yeah. So, you know, that is, um, uh, it's just been fascinating to watch her um, evolve as a leader uh, and, yeah. and, and, and really just, I think, outmaneuver Trump on so many different policy issues. Yeah. Rob, what do you think looking at the Trump Pelosi interactions? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> she, um, she's very good. Um, you know, I think, you know, Hassard, Boehner, Ryan, all um, had difficult relationships with her for various reasons. Um, but she's very calculating. She knows where her caucus is. She knows how to get the votes. She has a very tight control of her leadership team. Um, you know, the um, progressives have vexed her, um, I would say, and frustrated her legislatively. Mm -hmm. But... Um, you know, I think um, it hasn't been as bad as our Tea Party movement. They haven't actually shut down the Congress yet. We'll see if they do. Um, but I think she's done a good job. I mean, you have to give her an A for her um, 
this round of speaker, you know, and I think she's she's been really effective. I agree with Doug. Um, I think um, the government shutdown was a huge wake-up call. I hope to the administration that um, you know she's tough. She, she knows business, what she's doing, yeah. um, and um, you know, uh, let's not do that again. I hope I hope that was a hot plate <laughs> moment. <laughs> um, but I, w I, you know, I'd like to talk to about what Doug said. I mean, yeah. um, about um, you know the number of candidates who ran last cycle yeah. on the Democratic side, women who were elected, and I mean the the challenge the Republican Party always has when it comes to these issues is there's you know the builders, the plumbers in the party like myself, you know, in my previous lives that want to build things, and you're constantly trying to say how can we expand and right. how can we do stuff, and then there's a very it's it, of, of the. Uh, there's the crowd like, don't worry about it. We're not a collection of interests like Democrats. We're a, we're a movement. Either you get it or you don't, and people will come. Yeah. And so there's always like a, a certain resistance to we have to go get this, or we have to go identify that and build this thing around it. And, it's, and we have a tendency just to build organizations that don't specialize but just produce broad results. And I think Democrats are often much smarter that they say, I'm going to go target this audience and we're going to build structures around it. Yeah. So in the last six years, though, we've seen a lot of structures built for women, uh, super PACs, view PAC, um, um, uh, candidate education recruiting. I mean, political parties are fascinating businesses in America. They spend about $5 billion every two years, and neither, neither side has an HR department. Yeah. Neither side has a, has a, has a candidate, rec a candidate rec They don't have uh, <coughs> talent. You know, Deloitte has a $110 million facility down in Texas to take junior people and make them into senior people. And, like yeah. Neither party has it. It's like a bizarre <laughs> kind of, you know, situation. So you're kind of stuck with what you get. Yeah. And to, you know, when I was at the Senate committee, it was a constant complaint. We didn't have enough diversity. We didn't have. And my point was always, I'm at the end of the line. Senate is the end of the line. So if we don't have it at the, You've got at to the, the younger, pipeline. yeah, if we don't have yeah. the, the, so the good news is we're seeing stories. I mean, um, Republican women's groups are raising more money than they've ever raised. They're recruiting more candidates. And it was refreshing that the Yale School of Campaigns and Politics reports more record-breaking number of Republican women reaching out to go yeah. to their school. So it tells me, you know, we've added uh, Republican women to the Senate. When, when I was first in 14, I think we had three. Now, we, uh, you know, we've added Marsha Blackburn. We had Joni Ernst. Um, right, really but the House numbers, candidate. I mean, there are 89 Democrats in the House right now, female Democrats. There's 13 <clears throat> Republicans. Well, I think 30 that, years ago in 1989, there was also 13 Republicans. Right, but I also think if you look at the losses, yeah. it came out of suburban seats that swung. Yeah. So Amy Walters, I mean, you look at those seats, and that was so, so the Republican women disproportionately took a hit out of that caucus. But so that's my point is, yeah, is, yeah it's, it's, it's something, like I said, the plumbers on my side of the aisle are saying, how can we build out an infrastructure to build a pipeline? Um, and I think we've had a lot of success, and yeah. I feel really encouraged by it. And the other thing, which is really refreshing to see, because you, it was a challenge in the past, because um, you know they were just seen as long shot candidates. Is you're seeing um, women like Susan Collins just raising and getting the support of the institutional Republicans. So um, you know a lot of times Republican women had a challenge nationally fundraising because they just didn't have the networks, they didn't have the support. And this, the last, I'd say the last six years, you've seen just millions of dollars being raised by the women, which I think, say what you want about everything else, if you don't have the money, you have nothing else. So, yeah. I mean, it's been really encouraging to see that kind of structural shift. But it's gonna take time, it's gonna take, you know, I mean, the Democratic Party identified this problem 15 years ago, and they've been investing in it, and I think we were probably like in everything, technology, everything. But We're you guys, a slow. you know, after 2012, sort of did the hand wringing and the postmortem <laughs> and identified this need to expand, right. but nothing ever happened. That's not true. We had five female candidates run for the Senate in 2015. I mean, yeah, but they, I mean, they led statewide tickets. And and the the but the fundraising component. I mean, Emily's list is you know here that that Republicans can't seem to find a fundraising mechanism to. Well, that's what I said. I mean, anywhere near that. Like I said, that's because we they're, we they're intellectually we intellectually struggle with that type of yeah uh, identity single issue voting right. kind of identity because yeah. there's a general feeling yeah. of like either you get it or you don't right they're, they're, you know um, but and interestingly so, and, though and so institutionally yeah. there's like always kind of like a reverse pressure on that stuff and now you're yeah. seeing that kind of breakdown yeah. and you're seeing you know view pack you're seeing 
um, Elise Stefanik step right. up and say, hey, we're going to just specialize in this one area. But she had to step she had, up and do that. And she was not well, very well received yes. in some quarters yes. as well. But you I know? think that was seen as like anti-women. What I'm seeing is, what I'm seeing, that is a perfect reflection of this mentality like, we ought to work together. Yeah. And if we don't work together, we break down what we are. Yeah. And so it took a little while for the leadership to be like, oh, this isn't a competing effort. That's what they, they, they didn't view it as like, oh, we don't want any more women. That's crazy. What they were saying is we don't want competition with our main political programs. We want a unified. And it took a few weeks for them to be like, oh, we can <laughs> eat, you know, yeah, walk yeah. and chew gum. Yeah, That's yeah, yeah. awesome, you know. So. <laughs> well, let me ask, let me ask uh, Elise this. In our esteemed uh, poll conducted by Bennett's mm -hmm. Strategy Group, um, we talked to a lot of women uh, voters from the 2018 midterms, and we did the poll in December, right after the midterms. And we, one of the questions was, um, looking at the composition of Congress before the election, so before more women were elected, do you think that there was too many women, a right amount of women, or too few women? And the disparity among women Democrats and independents versus Republican was striking. Uh, the Republican women just was a collective shrug of, eh, it's fine, 19 percent, it's fine. That, and, and whereas you see Democratic and independent women say, no, it's not fine, we need more women. So there doesn't seem to be an attitude among Republican women that there needs to be a need for more women representation. Therefore, it also makes it very difficult to convince Republican women to actually run for office if they don't even see the need for that sort of equality. Yeah, I mean, you've seen a lot of senior Republican women try to blaze a new path and yeah. raise the money and get something going and really operating, you know, almost separately of the party apparatus just out of their own goodwill. But no, I mean, there isn't really a concerted effort on behalf of the party. And you look at how women in the higher positions might care because they know how it's important institutionally, but then maybe our female voters don't actually care all that much and what they care about is who they're putting into office and what the partisan leaning is. Mm -hmm. And it's more about that's what the, you the see. Exactly, exactly. That goes on. Yeah. But there's one other thing that came out in our yeah. poll that I think is interesting on this front. And I think this goes to the ecosystem we're in. And I think with Trump and the tone he sets complicates it for Republicans right now. Normally when we do a poll and we ask on candidate qualities what's the most important thing, fights for people like me comes up first. In our poll with women after the midterms, it was can be counted on to get things done. Now, it wasn't that much ahead of fights for people like me. But what's interesting about that is that women think women are more than twice as likely as men uh, to be counted on to get things done. And so in an environment here where Washington has and Congress has the lowest approval rating it's ever had in history, and we've got Trump in the White House, whose tone we know is bothering women tremendously, I think that gets associated with the Republicans in a way that might both discourage women from running. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you, got, you know the work you have to do to get it there. Mm -hmm. But I also think it creates this challenge for you in the ecosystem going into a 2020 election where I think it's highly unlikely Trump is going to change his tone in any way. Uh, and so you're going to still have this toxic view of Washington. And I think the party that puts more women out there to run is going to have some success at the congressional level and at the Senate level. level. Well, as we look um, you know, at 2020 and the female candidates, there's been a lot of discussion on sort of that electability question. Um, and Doug, can you just unpack that a little bit as you kind of look at, you mentioned the, the women candidates who are in the top tier, Elizabeth Warren, Kamala, maybe this week, maybe not, but next right. week, maybe so. And how is, the, how is gender factoring into um, people's opinions of the candidates? I mean, I think that's a really good question, and that's something that um, I have a podcast that I do with uh, Adrian Elrod, and we've been talking a lot about that yeah. over the past seven or eight months. I saw a really interesting poll. It was done in June by Ipsos and Daily Beast, and they asked Dems and independent voters, um, and 70% of them said they would be comfortable with a female president. Mm -hmm. But they believed, but only 33% believed that their neighbors would be comfortable with a woman's, woman president. Yeah. Which, um, 
generates so they're comfortable but they don't think their neighbors well, they say are so they're that, comfortable th- that's right <laughs> but that but because their neighbor isn't that creates some level of doubt yeah. with them that Elizabeth Warren or Kamala Harris can win I think someone mentioned PTSD of the uh, yeah. election yesterday right. Right. I think that that still remains with a lot of Democratic voters as it relates to uh, um, putting a woman at the top of the ticket yeah. whether that's true or not that is um, I think still uh, is part of it. Um, but look, I think if you look at the campaign that Elizabeth Warren has run, she has run, in my opinion, the best campaign so far. Um, from where she started, where she was essentially, deal- her announcement was uh, overshadowed by questions about her ancestry. She was basically written off, and then she has just uh, incrementally improved her standing one or two points a, you know, a month. Mm-hmm. Um, she's made some very savvy, um, uh, decisions, uh, not taking, she basically doesn't do fundraisers with, with um, um, big donors. Uh, she uh, spent a lot of money early on, got a lot of criti- criticism because of her burn rate, but she invested all that money in staff in the early states. That probably has helped her. Um, and she's created an identity for herself, which is really hard in a field that's 22, 23 people, which is the person, you know, the, camp, the candidate with plans. Um, and she, I think, has tried to tackle this issue of electability in that way. And um, she has also, I think, made herself more available to voters than um, I believe Secretary Clinton did in 2016 in terms of humanizing herself with this, the selfie line, right? Right. And, um, and she does really, I think, just really good stuff, really um, uh, uh, strong social media stuff on Instagram where she is calling her supporters. And she'll always say, you know what, my opponents or, or you know, the other Democrats are calling big donors. You know, I'm just calling a supporter to get to know them and talk to them and thank them. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think it has really in many ways humanized uh, her. Uh, but the electability issue, you know, I, I think that Look, I don't think that is rel- – I don't know if that's so much a, uh, uh, necessarily something that is surrounds women candidates because I know that, you know, all candidates have to deal with the issue of electability. Um, but I do think that there are unique things that women candidates and people of color candidates have to do uh, where they're w- basically walking a tightrope, you know, because you have to hit the exact right tone if you're a black male running for office. If you come across as too, you know, too too aggressive or too passionate, you you will be the angry black male. With women, you know, if you're if you were if you are too aggressive or or uh, too strong, you're called the B word. If you're too um, if you're too accommodating, you're called passive. You know, so you're constantly trying to jigger yourself to fit this like narrow line where I don't believe white male candidates have to do that. Right, that's a good point. And- this is what I, you know, you want to think that maybe we've grown so much since 2016. And I just remember all of the focus groups that we did in the run up to that election and hearing constantly how Hillary Clinton was judged for her husband and that judgment versus her husband having his own agency and how much that just clouded everything. And, you know, you hope, oh, well, this is an isolated case. This is a special case. This is a former first lady. We're talking about Hillary this way, perhaps, because it's been, you know, this many years of the public limelight. But then you look at this slate of candidates and what people aren't saying, and I'll go ahead and say it because people are saying it to each other, it's the likability question. And so how, why does a woman have to overcome that? And can she overcome it? There's a certain portion of the population she just is never going to be able to overcome simply by merit of being a woman and I was talking with a Republican strategist who is quite sharp the other day and he's like you can't say this but she reminds a lot of men Elizabeth Warren does of a woman in their life who is a nag Hmm. and you just don't get that with a man and there's nothing that even with that great strategy even with all of her efforts to humanize herself do you ever fundamentally overcome just what is nature and how women are perceived no matter what? Yeah, and not to open too big of a can of worms here with Joel, but <laughs> <laughs> going back to Hillary and you know PTSD from 2016, the likability factor is there as well. 
um, part A, and then part B is how significant, even though, by the way, uh, we are ready to elect a woman president because more people in this country voted for her for president than as she, as she would say, she got more votes than any white man in history. Yeah. Uh, she also had a big gap. I mean, she beat Donald Trump by about 3 million votes. Now, yeah. we have the Electoral College. Those are the rules of the game. And, you know, we fumbled the ball right. in that game. And that's the difference between this election and not. But is there this conventional um, wisdom that, oh, because she lost, we are not ready for a woman to be president? No, I don't think so. Um, and I think the other thing that was unique in the 2000 and uh, 16 election is you had two candidates running who had the highest unfavorable ratings of any two candidates for president pretty much ever. Yeah. <laughs> they were both at about 55 to 57 percent unfavorable. They were both at 57 percent viewed as not honest and trustworthy. Now, I had to answer questions about Hillary Clinton not being honest and trustworthy every time I was on television. Trump's people would never ask that question. So is there a bias there? Obviously. It, it probably goes back to some of the things Elise said. Mm -hmm. She was carrying a lot of stuff from her husband's presidency that worked against us. And it was very frustrating for me in interviews. Like, and I'd get off the set and say, why the hell aren't you asking Trump surrogates this? 57% of Americans don't trust them for a reason. And never got asked that question. Nobody in the Trump campaign ever got asked that question. So I think there is a, a, a real challenge there. And no, it's not PTSD. I mean, I think, you know, the other thing I would say, by the way, is, and people have heard this, and I'm not trying to relitigate this, but we did lose three states by a total of 77,000 votes, uh, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan, where 660,000 people voted third party. And if you go back and look at exit polls, more women voted third party than men significantly. So, you know, and that's a, those errors in those states were on the Clinton campaign, right. not going to those states, not campaigning in those states. And that's how close the election was that, you know, if you think about 77,000 votes across three states and 660,000 people voting third party, there was obviously something we could have done about that. I mean, I think, you know, to Joel's point about sort of the questions he was facing on, you know, on TV and with reporters, you know, that there, was, there was a study I just read that... Um, Two-thirds of the national stories being written, written about the 2020 race are being written by men. Uh -huh. um, in 2018, 90% of the um, people covering politics for the New York Times were white. 70% um, were male. Yeah. So when you're looking at these questions of electability and likability and how campaigns are being covered, you know, some of that, a lot of that stems from diversity within the newsroom. Yeah. And... Um, you know, I think the New York Times made a, in 2017, they hired a, a gender editor um, to look at that, uh, which I think was an, a really important step. But that is something that if you look at these newsrooms, um, there has to be improvement, both at a gender level and also, an, uh, you know, an, uh, a race and ethnicity level, because those are, those are the people who are writing the stories. Right. And I will say um, the debates this time have been very inclusive in terms of gender and diversity in terms of the debate moderators, mm -hmm. which I think is a good step yeah. forward. I mean, I mean the, the days of, of, is... of, like, you know, two white guys moderating a debate are gone, yeah. right? The um, next debate is, I think, moderated by all women. All women, exactly. Um, yeah. Um, back to this electability question one more time, because we, in another wonderful poll that we did at the Women in Politics Institute on that issue of electability, one of the things that we found was that when you really, when someone can dismiss someone as not being electable, for example, like Elizabeth Warren, but when you really dig down and ask somebody, what does electability, what do you really look for? What does it really mean? That's when you see people saying things like, oh, does the, can the candidate hold their own on a debate stage? Um, can she take on the opposition or, or he? Um, do, do they have a well thought out plan? Those are all actual qualities though that we see some of the, women in 2020 exuding, especially in the debates, Elizabeth Warren, Kamala Harris certainly taking on her opponents. And so this notion of electability sometimes gets dismissed and, you know, the big bad media can sort of use it as a way to kind of dismiss a female candidate as well. What do you think about that, Joel? Um, 
Look, I think electability is something that every candidate actually carries. I yeah. mean, nobody thought Jimmy Carter was electable but, until he won the Iowa right. caucuses. It's not necessarily gender. He, he caught everybody asleep at the switch. Nobody was campaigning in Iowa. He went there. He won these caucuses that none of us had heard of at that point, right? And suddenly he was on the map. Um, and I think the same is true to some extent for Barack Obama. When we worked with President Obama, then Senator Obama, oh, yeah. you know, in 2007 and 8, we knew there were a lot of African Americans who didn't think that an African American could get elected president. And then he wins the Iowa caucuses, and African American voters saw a whole lot of white voters voting for this guy. <laughs> and suddenly the floodgates opened, and they right. relaxed a little bit and said, hey, we can be with this guy. It's not going to be a disappointment. But at the end of the day, I think the burden of proof on electability is on candidates. Mm -hmm. And I think when I talk to candidates, and I, I don't know if any of the consultants do this, I have one question I ask people when they say they're running for president. What makes you think you're the best person to be president of the United States at this moment in time? And that encompasses a lot of things. What are your personal qualities? What does this moment in time require in a president? And what makes you uniquely able to meet the challenges of this moment? And I think the candidates who can best articulate that are typically the candidates who actually go out and prove their electability. Because day in and day out, they're going to be driving a singular message that's going to be meeting the voters where they live in a powerful way and telling a compelling personal story that suggests I'm the person who can meet these challenges for you. Um, I think we have some time for questions, yes, right? Yes, we do. We don't have to wait until 12.15. Okay, so let's get a couple questions in, and I can jump in. Uh, please wait for the microphone. Um, Anzalone, back there. Thanks. So yes. um, one thing that I think we could you great. identify yourself? Please? Yes, John Anzalone, <laughs> uh, the second best, the, the group, second best pollster are. in New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> no, but one thing for viewers, because I think it's maybe the best, one of the best newsletters out there is your Women Lead. Oh, thank you. And, we you know, yeah, you might want to tell them about we that. We Lead Reader, you can sign Well, not only that, it's like I, I make my staff read it, and it's probably more valuable for men than it is for women because what you would miss if you don't read it. The second thing is I am, you know, Joel and I have done three or four or five presidentials, and one thing that I think I view or find is an untold story, maybe the biggest change is not just the female candidates, um, but is the female staffers who are at the ground floor in a strategic level. Yeah. We've always had women. I mean, Kiki Moore led the way, Donna Brazil, Jen Palmieri, you can name them. But when I look at the field out there of who are running these campaigns and or are part of the strategic team, whether it is Liz Smith and Katie Connolly with uh, Buttigieg, whether it's Kate Bedefield and Simone Sanders with Biden, Biden yeah. Jen O'Malley with, you know, uh, a Beto, uh, Sabrina Singh with Cooper, uh, uh, Booker. It is a, a really a seismic shift, not just because they're women, but they're young women and they're women of color. And I think that this is a huge story, and I, th I think it might be worth a discussion. Yeah. Anybody else want to weigh in on that, Doug? I know you made that point a little earlier as well. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a. I think it's a great thing for the party. Um, diversity of the candidates was always talked about, in the, you know, and I think it was a, a strength of ours. But it's also the diversity of the staff. Um, but the reality is, is I mean, look, the, the Democratic Party at, still has a long way to go in terms of uh, having diverse uh, um, strategists at the consultant level. Um, there, I can count the number of media consultants on a hand um, and pollsters, and you, I could count both of them on this hand. And that's just, I mean, I just think that's just, just But the pipeline might be coming, because usually it's the people that are working on that ca on campaigns that for their next act are going to be the media strategists. I hope so. Right. Yeah, no, so, no, I, mean, no, I hope so. We're talking about the that, strength of the pipeline. The, the, so. the pipeline is, yes, I would hope that is the case. Yeah. But, um, look, there was a pipeline when Obama got elected. I mean, he had a number of, you know, he had diverse, um, you know, uh, staffers, too, and, um, there has been a big effort uh, at the House and Senate level to uh, diversify staff. Uh, I think we've seen improvements there, but three years ago there were no black chiefs of staff in the Senate and no black communications directors. Hmm. Um, that has improved a little bit, but still, you know, there still needs to be um, a lot of work there. And, you know, like when you're looking at voters and particularly the, Af the Democratic Party, Doug Jones would not be senator today unless he 
unless, uh, except for uh, African American women who turned out uh, for him. Mm -hmm. um, when we look at the improvements that Democrats made with women uh, that, uh, in 2018 versus 2016, uh, a lot of that was based off of just improving their numbers with African American women. We did improve with white non-college educated women as well. Um, in order to win the South Carolina primary, 33% of that electorate is going to be African American women, and if you and if you don't do well with that demographic, you will not win South Carolina. Uh, I think the reason why you know Joe Biden, it, I think, has uh, been the most um, effective candidate so far in building a coalition that probably that is that seems to be reflecting a general election um, coalition. We'll see how long that lasts, but he is the person who right now is doing extremely well with African Americans, and that primarily is older African Americans and older African American women. How does Kamala factor into that too, in terms of African American women and their support for her? You know, I uh, I think that. Um, Look, she is. She has, I think, been a very. She has worked very hard to appeal to African American women. She, um, you know, she talks. She she launched her campaign or part of her campaign at Howard University. Did an event with her sorority. Um, it has been something that she has talked about. But for whatever reason, it just hasn't. She hasn't been able to connect. And um, part of that may be, you know, um, this connection that uh, voter that. You know, black voters, particularly African American, older African American women, have with uh, President Obama, mm -hmm. and um, that has been sort of transferred to Biden. Mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah, it's it's an interesting phenomenon. I mean, you know, I don't think, but the reality is, I don't think anyone should just believe that because Cory Booker is black right. or Kamala Harris is black that black voters are going to support them. Of course, There's, right. Black voters have been voting for white candidates for an extremely long time. Um, so <laughs> yeah. that is, yeah. you know, I mean, I think that that is, that is something. She's going to have to earn it. And, yeah. um, you know, she does I, seem to have made that a, a, one of the priorities in her campaign yeah, in terms of outreach. Like I think she has some other issues with her narrative and message yeah. that um, is hurting her, hurting her with a lot of voters, yeah. to be honest. Mr. K. Park. Uh, uh, Doug, I just want to get your reaction to this because, you know, I always get asked the question, um, why isn't Kamala getting traction with the African American vote? And my thinking is part of, and for Corey as well, Senator Booker, that among the African American community, they don't think, African American voters don't think that they will vote for another black person for president. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if um, what you think about that and if that is a, if that's a real thing. Oh, you mean from a, yeah. So it's like electability based on rights. Right. No, no, I haven't seen that. I mean, um, in focus groups that I've looked at and polling, I haven't necessarily seen that. I, I think there is just something about um, right now an, uh, an inability by Kamala Harris to connect with all voters. Um, not just black voters. She has such a glaring message problem. And and I think right. And I think that um, until she does something about that, um, she's going to be you know she's going to continue to be where she is. I'm not sure if it's skepticism about her ability to take on Trump um, or win. Uh, I think there's just something more functionally wrong with her her campaign and her message. Kiki, I want to address something and ask a question of the panel. The first is on this issue of pipeline and talent, and, and I think John raised a really important point, which I think Elise and those of us who are the comms gals can say, we've always been allowed to play in press, right? We were always, the girls were always allowed to play in press. It's like the women uh, in the companies, they're always the it. HR. That's right, right. <laughs> yeah. So the question was, could we get to the table, to the strategic table, and when you see the Emmy Ruizes of the world, and uh, and you know even more junior people like Deshauna Bernard at, uh, at Elizabeth Warren's campaign. I, I was the communications director at the DNC 25 years ago, right? And pipeline building has to be intentional, right? So the earliest stages of having people of color in the communications pipeline, it didn't exist because most young people of color 
came up through church politics and in the field, Cross right? Ways. So you had to be really intentional to go over to that team and say, hey, come over here and learn comms. We got room for you. And, it, and 25 years later, we still need to do that to disperse both gender and color into the other facets. So I just, it, it's intentional. It's never going to happen organically yeah. by a stepladder. Mm -hmm. okay? It's, it's going to require people at the senior level looking up and saying, where is the organic seed to talent? And then how do we disperse the talent and then train the talent up? So I just want to be really clear about that. I want to talk about candidates, women candidates, and the role of being a CEO versus a legislator, right? So the Barbara Lee Foundation now kind of has the mantle on a lot of research around this, but it started out with some early folks working on the Democratic side for women governors. And the dynamic of women who run for CEO versus a legislative position and what people expect, they go back to the earliest days of an Ann Richards candidacy, obviously being the most famous, and the inherent bias of women on women for women who run for office premenopausal, in other words, they're still raising their children at home, versus women later in life who, yes, we're willing to let you run for office now because your children mm -hmm. have flown the coop. And that's a, a women on women bias, and I'd like to explore that a little bit with you guys. Interesting. Well, that's, I mean, in 2008, that was the big question with Sarah Palin before everyone realized she was a total loon, was, wow, <laughs> she has just too many children. <coughs> How can she? How can she be vice president if she's got so many children to take care of? Yes, it was. I remember very distinctly. That was my grandmother's reaction, uh, and she was certainly a lifelong Republican. But today, you look at the women. You know, is Elizabeth Warren maybe doing a little bit better because she is of a certain age bracket, and it's not perceived as quite as threatening? Well, look at Nancy Pelosi too. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Um, you know, I think about, if you think about, no, I, I, if you think about, you know, progressive states and you think of the coastal states, if you think of New York and California, right, um, you know, we, we, and look, this is a, a blight on the Democratic Party in my home state, which is New York, you know, we, we have not had a woman candidate for governor. And there have, there are uh, so many states that have never right? had a female yeah. governor. You know, California, um. Yeah. You know, have we had, who was the last woman candidate who won the nomination for governor? Um, so I think this is an endemic problem, and I think it goes to, you know, a point that everybody on the panel has made here. Like, you've got to be conscious about this in the selection uh, process of <clears throat> candidates. I think that um, there's no question there's still a lot of sexism in America. We're living through, you know, a period, you know, the Me Too movement, where women for how many decades weren't being listened to on questions of sexual harassment in the workplace. So if your voices aren't being heard when you're being abused by men in power, you know, it's obviously indicates a big mountain we have to climb in the public debate and the public square uh, for women to be able uh, to be treat, treated and seen equally as men. And we still have a long way to go on that front. And I think it's true in both parties. I don't think the Democrats, while we, I think, probably have a, a better record of electing women and nominating women, um, but it still is way uh, insufficient. And is there a difference, though, in between electing what you have to help do to help a candidate get elected in a CEO role, a governor, a mayor, a president, versus a city council, mm -hmm. state legislative race, Senate? There, there probably is. I mean, I haven't, you know, I haven't done that many governor's races, right? I've probably done more presidentials than governor's races, oddly. Um, maybe about the same number. Um, but, um, you know, we've had more women governors, uh, you know, for sure, um, than obviously women presidents <laughs> or vice, even, pres even nominees and, and, and serious contenders. So, you know, who was the first woman governor elected? Um, was it Ann Richards? I mean, yeah. before that, right? Yeah. You, yes. And by yes. the way, and you've Texas. also had women governors elected in Kansas. Kansas has elected how many women governors, right? Two or three, mm -hmm. right? Um, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. right. So, um, no, wait, Lynn has the mic, so you just a minute, please. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 sit down. 
<laughs> no, don't give that to him. <laughs> we have a question. I, I told him to say please. Yeah. <laughs> he can wait his turn. Ah, mansplaining he's going to do. <laughs> All right. Well, I wanted to bring Rob into the conversation because talking about, and then Jonathan uh, will let you in. Um, because talking about women in politics, one woman I'm watching and just with, I don't know, empathy, watch, is Susan Collins mm -hmm. of Maine mm -hmm. and watching one of the stalwarts of the Republican, a standard bearer woman for Republicans, thinking about, and, and for all the panelists, not just for Rob, but. Um, you know, how, how is she getting whipsawed in this election? Yeah. Um, how do these national tectonic forces play on Maine? And then they're in danger of losing, you know, yet another woman in a very high... Um, I don't think Murkowski's in the same vulnerable position, but um, watching these two Republican women. Um, well, first, I, I was remiss in not thanking NYU and, and everyone who came together to make this happen, so thank you. Um, and if I can give our moderator a homework assignment, oh. you said something I'm fascinated by. Yeah. And hopefully we can continue this and see meet after the election yeah, next yeah, year. Yeah. But you said, if I could put a, uh, a thought in that you may not express, yeah. but it seemed to, in your poll, a sense of frustration that you got a collective meh from the Republican women yeah. about should there be women. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's part of how we talk past each other yeah. because the, the issue of diversity, uh, what we've just been talking right. about, when you talk to Republicans, you get a collective, like, meh. Yeah. Like, just get the best person. Find the Right, like, right, right. Well, it's like this lack of focus on you know, identity. Campaigns are alpha dog moments and let the strong survive and right. the weak fail. And so, uh, and maybe that's too harsh or too simplistic, but I'm just trying to boil it down because I'm trying to get to a broader no point. But there's no conversations like Kiki was saying of like, we need to have a pipeline. Let's start bringing, let's go over to the field people and bring them over to comms. Like, that's like a concerted effort that happens. Um, I wouldn't I say think. that. No? I mean, I'm, I'm not, I, I would say there is a, a lot more than okay. you, you speak, a lot, lot more um, desire to promote. Yeah. I mean, um, there, I mean, you look at our community, I mean, I could list all my friends who yeah. work at committees, do but. Do you but, think, though, if you were comparing the Bush campaign and well, women I guess, in, Leadership I roles. guess what I'm saying is, is that Republican voters think differently about right. these issues. Right, right, right. And so you did a question from a certain perspective that yeah. you got the answer that doesn't shock me, but it shocked you, which yeah, is, yeah, yeah. yeah, I don't really don't like that. Yeah. Like, can they get stuff done? Are they looking out for me? You know, the top two Joel questions, yeah, I think, yeah. is much more. Whether it, like, we, they just, they don't view that. And and I'll, I'll use an example to show you kind of how um, Republicans think, but they don't. They, they think differently than on these issues than I think Democratic voters. And, and part of it is, it's like, it's like you, segue, bear with me. You, you ask people about energy, and they, you know, both parties love renewables, and both parties love you know, certain sources of energy. Then you say coal, and it's like they put their jerseys on, it's right, like, <laughs> right to their partisan right, corners. Right, right, because right. we've been trained, if you're a true Republican, you love coal, and if you're a true Democrat, you hate coal. I mean, that's just, so I think on this issue, I, I wonder if, on the Democratic side, these issues have been partisanized, partisanized, so that if you're a true Democrat, you you think these are important. Whether, right. It's yeah. And and maybe the Republicans are they're, they're just different. But you know, you look at the history of the Republican Party, and the number one most popular politician in South Carolina is Nikki Haley. The number mm -hmm. two is Tim Scott. Mm -hmm. You look at the fact that we've had over um, 20 House members in the last six years, probably. I had to count them up, but over 20 who came out of majority white primaries to win majority white seats that were people of color, uh, Hispanic, Asian, African American. Um, you know, Mia Love in Utah, right. I mean, um, to, to cite not just South, not just, I mean, this is geographic diversity where the Democratic Party can't say that. I mean, their minority candidates come out of majority minority, minority. districts, mm -hmm. and they don't have a quarter of those numbers. And so there's this perception, and it's frustrating as, as a campaign person to hear, oh, Republican voters won't do X, when there's a body of work that says that that's not true. It's just the issues are framed up in such a way that for media and for, like for this panel, yeah. like a Republic, I, I would just argue Republican voters would, you know, be hitting, change the channel on this panel because they don't, they don't think this way. They're completely... Um, because because they haven't been conditioned to like. Well, it has been partisan, yeah. like, but also, I guess uh, a classic 
Republican thought is like, you know, the, the best will get to the top. Or so. I, I'm not summarizing it the way I'd like, but my point is um, it's been a challenge on these issues because, like I said, there's, there's always a, a fundamental question of do we need this? Hey, I'm Elise Stefanik. I'm a, you know, hotshot young congresswoman. I yeah. want to start a new, new movement. Whoa, we, we already have a program. Like, well, why, you know, and it's not that it's anti women, anti anything. It's, um, it's just a totally different mentality of, of, of um, you know. But when you, but when you look at that issue of Republican women running in primaries, the problem is that they can't get through the primary system um, because it is the old boys club in a lot of cases, which is why I think Elise is making that effort specifically helping women get out of primaries. I think it's, I think, sh I think that, I mean, I just detailed the history that yeah. that's not actually true. Um, but I think the challenge is building the candidates, finding them and encouraging them to run has yeah. been our challenge because right. it's very, just figured out and that's part of the problem. And then the other challenge is that um, candidates have had trouble raising money and that's always yeah, been, yeah, yeah. been a huge challenge for us. But I mean, you look right now in Michigan, uh, uh, John James is running again statewide. He's, gonna, he's not gonna get primary, but he went through a primary last time you know, uh, and that electorate, you know, overwhelmingly endorsed him and endorsed him again. I mean, um, I think Michigan's tough in a presidential year, but he's going to be well-funded. He's going to have all the resources in the world, and he's going to run a world-class campaign. Um, so that's when you look and say, how can we do better? And that's the frustrating part for, like, the plumbers in the party like yeah. me who say, you know, we need to have, you know, a stronger outreach into these communities. Can I? I, I can, like can, yeah. Can I? Can I say a yeah. couple of things about the? So in 2010, we elected four women governors. We elected uh, two women to the United States Senate. We elected eight women to the House of Representatives. Um, that year, that's the, incredible. Who was the chair of that the year? De, yeah, <laughs> a hell of an accomplishment. And, and the Democrats elected four women to the House in 2010 to our eight. Um, and the emphasis was very much in line with what Rob was saying. The emphasis was finding voters where they were, elevating those voters up in the community to be considered as prospective candidates for office. Um, I didn't even get into what we did at the legislative letter level where we elected women, Hispanics, African Americans. We elected two African American judges in Texas uh, to the courts, uh, court system. So it's a matter of, of, of focus, determination, discipline. But the other side of what Rob is saying with respect to the party, and he's absolutely right, there is a sort of like, okay, let's, can we just do the best person and, and put that person out there? Mm -hmm. But here's the flip side of that. It becomes an excuse for a lot of people to do nothing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because then it's easier to say, well, we're, we're looking for the best person. Oh yeah, that's great, I'm, I want you to find the first the best black person. Mm -hmm. I want you to find the best woman. I want you to find the best Hispanic to run in this community because that's what this community needs. And if we want to make the case about our own diversity and our own involvement in that diversity, we love touting our history. I'm so sick and tired of hearing Republicans say, well, you know, we supported civil rights. Okay, yeah, but what have you done for me lately? <laughs> And that's the attitude of the black community. It's like, okay, we got what you did in 1868, <laughs> all right? But we know what you did in 1968. Mm -hmm. and when you executed a strategy where you figured you no longer needed us. Mm -hmm. So when I was national chairman, one of the first things I declared was the Southern strategy is over. <clears throat> and the level of pushback in the party to that was immense. Um, and, and so it, it, there's still this sort of pressure within the party. Um, guys like Rob, who are the plumbers, they dig deep, they dig, dig long, they find really good people, they try to get them exposed, they try to get them elevated, but then the problem that you, I'm sure you would confirm, you would often run into, is that when you got to the state party level, and certainly to the national level, there was always someone there who would go, yeah, yeah, but we've already got somebody. It's his turn. Yeah, it's their turn. And, and so it's the matter of when you, you make it the priority to push people through. I remember when I got the, the day I was elected, one of the members, the 168, uh, came up to me and said she was so excited. 
She said, oh, so I'm so happy. Now blacks will join the Republican Party. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, do, do I look like a Pied Piper to you? You think <laughs> black people are going to wake up tomorrow morning and go, oh, damn, That's they elected okay. a black man. I think I'm going to join the Republican Party. And so that you still have that mindset that sits, that's still there yeah. a little bit. Um, that's important to understand. On the women's piece specifically, if, to address that, uh, I have been surprised and frustrated at uh, the lack of push uh, for more women, particularly given what Republican women do in the Republican Party. I'll be honest with you. There is no Republican Party without Republican women. It just isn't. The men are friggin' lazy. They just, they, <laughs> they're just not, they're not committed, they're not dedicated, they're not disciplined enough to do the grind. And the women do the grinding. And what I'm looking for is that trigger moment. Yeah. Uh, and I'd really be interested to get Elise and Rob's perspective on this because you guys still tap into that pulse a little bit. Um, that trigger moment where women say, like we've seen on the Democratic side, whether through movements or uh, organizations like Emily's List or whatever, where they say, screw it, it's time we take control of this and we begin to push beyond doing the grind to elevate the men and get them elected. We turn that energy on ourselves to push our, our agenda and to push, I mean, because that's, that's really been the strength of the party. I've seen it as a county chairman, I've seen it as a state chairman, and as national chairman, the role that women play, yet that doesn't translate in, in their elevation to elective office, right. and, and which is why what we did and focused on in 2010 was such a big deal, getting four governors, mm -hmm. female governors elected that year. Well, just within the party, and Rob, feel free to disagree with this, but I just know so many young Republican women, talented Republican women, who don't want to be a part of it anymore. And so they're leaving these political jobs. They you know, might be a rising star, but they don't want to be a part of it. And with, with the influence of the Trump sons on every facet of the RNC and picking delegates for this, you know, this woman, she's uh, you know, too pro this, like can't have her this go around at the convention. And it just, I mean, it's crippling having Donald Trump at the top. There's not going to be, I'm really pessimistic, but there's not going to be any progress for Republican women as a force within the party as long as you've got this albatross. Um, to, <laughs> Have at it, Rob. Have at it. <laughs> to Michael Steele's point, um, <laughs> I would say um, I think, you know, when the Republican Party got um, destroyed by a lack of research, we said as a party we're going to fix that, and America Rising was created, and we've been fiendishly uh, successful at that. Um, when we got destroyed by Obama's data machine, we said we're going to fix that, and we built data trust, and I think it's been a, a massive improvement over what we had. Um, and uh, it was built, and it was created, and it took us a few beatings to get our our dollars and our strategies in line, but we did it. And I'm seeing probably for the first time in, in my, my career, um, real money actually flow. When I, in 14, um, some of the groups that focus on Republican women candidates would come to us and say how they had thousands of dollars to support women candidates. And um, there are super PACs now focused on Republican women that are raising millions of dollars. And they're getting the big checks that they always needed to get. So I think structurally, you're starting to see the Republican Party, you know, we're an elephant. We're slow. <laughs> we turn slowly. But, and it's frustrating, believe me. Uh, innovation is hard for our party, and we have, to, we have to get hit over the head multiple elections. Um, but I'm seeing the structural change. And also, you're seeing a core of young, um, especially in the Senate, young women, the senators, who are coming together for the first time. They, they started raising money together. They started working together. And I think only good things can happen. But work needs to be done. And uh, to answer your question about Susan Collins, um, um, uh, being married to a Susan Collins, I have a unique perspective. <laughs> Susan Collins. Um, and uh, and um, I'd like to say, I, I, I don't think she would be mean about it, but I think she would say, I don't want your empathy. I'm tougher than nails, and I'm, yeah. I'm taking all comers. Um, uh, she is... Uh, really, really tough. And
and I mean that in a glowing way. And um, there's a reason why she um, always won elections so big up in Maine. And she knows that state. She's a part of the DNA. I predict she's going to win. And I also predict uh, the Republican Party is going to open up their coffers and support her like she's never seen before. So uh, it's, you know, she won't lack for anything other than the environment, which she can't control. The national environment yeah. may take her out, but if it's if the people of Maine have a have a Maine choice to make, mm -hmm. she'll win. Just speaking about the particularly the House, um, I think one thing that we've seen over the lot, particularly in 2018, uh, is that this no, the notion that you're going to wait your turn, particularly in the Democratic Party, but maybe I'll let you guys speak for the Republican Party, but in the Democratic Party, the notion that you're going to wait your turn, like that's all gone. And I think that started, uh, we talked a little bit about this with Obama in 08, but like when there's no, the, at, particularly for congressional races, and I think in statewide races, we were talking earlier about gubernatorial races and why the same progress we've seen in the, like in the House, not necessarily in governor's mansions. And, Maybe it just has to do with like state pol statewide politics, and you know the fact that maybe you, you know there is a notion to sort of breaking through that old boy network within state politics is maybe even harder than um, when you're than than running for the house. Um, and in the house, you have, I mean, Emily's list does do statewide elections, but they are very effective in recruiting candidates uh, at the house level and pushing them, particularly in primaries. Um, they don't have any problem supporting pro-choice women candidates who are in competitive primaries. And that, that's very helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, I, I just think that this, you know, if there's an opportunity, you know, candidates right now, or if you're thinking about running, you're not, you're not waiting, it, waiting anymore. Uh, Doug, I think you're absolutely right on that. You don't have to wait in line anymore. But I want to go back to this issue of, of it was very intentional on the part of operative staff and leaders to get more Democratic women to be successful in governor's races. And you saw for about a 10-year run a boom of Democratic women governors, right? Um, from Jennifer Granholm, Janet Napolitano, Ruth Ann Minner and Ann Richards led the way, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it was not by happenstance. The group of women who have run and lost governorships went and met with women who were about to run and told them why and had women who had run and won came in the room. And these were small and quite intentional meetings and conversations. And Heidi Heitkamp is somebody who recognized that very early on in her run for governor, right? Mm -hmm. So here was a woman who still had young children at home, experienced breast cancer in the general election, um, was an extraordinarily qualified candidate, ran on a ticket with Al Gore in North Dakota, always a challenge. <laughs> um, but the other factors had something to do with her loss as well, right? It wasn't one. And so when folks were making that intentional effort, you will find that these women candidates who have run and won and run and lost have come back together specifically around these CEO roles. Mm -hmm. And it, all of those candidates who won will tell you those, that engagement and that intentionality was extraordinarily important to their success. And I think both parties ought to pay attention to that for women. You know, this may fall into the perception is reality category, but in the 2018 exit polls, they asked a question about uh, the importance of uh, electing more women. 78% um, uh, said it was very and somewhat important to elect more women uh, to elective office. And by 6632, those folks voted Democratic. Among the 20% who said it wasn't all that important at all, um, they voted 8413 for Republicans. So whether the efforts are that are taking place are permeating the Republican Party down to the grassroots, I think may be yes. something that, that remains to be yes. seen. Yes, Women yes, yes, yes. No, that's yes. the exit polls from the 2018 elections. Uh, the voice in the back of the room wants to interject. Wow, it's getting rowdy out here. And this, uh, this is actually a good segue for me. Um, <laughs> I, I didn't see the floor, did I here? Would somebody turn off his microphone? Look, one other Mr. point. Mr. Benson, Hold on. I'm paying one, for this microphone. Hang on. One, just give me one last point. And I don't think, I, I don't think we have time. I don't think we have time for this discussion today. But when you look at exit polls and you look at some issues, and I'll pass this in a second. But 
when you look at support for stricter gun controls, when you look post-Kavanaugh hearings in 2018 about keeping Roe versus Wade as is, mm -hmm. those numbers were uh, incredibly uh, dominant among women, and uh, they, you know, support stricter gun controls. They strongly support keeping Roe as, as, as is. And so we went into that election with a very galvanized electorate, not just around uh, identity and, and partisanship, but also around the issues that each party is on the same side of. And if a party is going to oppose bills like equal pay for women, I think you're going to have a hard time convincing them when I said earlier women put their economic lives front and center like everybody else. There's a, there's a panoply of issues here where I think there is a disparity on the issues between Democrats yes. and Republicans that's meaningful. Um. That's a, a great jumping off point. In fact, it was better uh, before that, that must uh, raise the rough. You had a stat, Joel, that said what? You said the people who, who believe that it was not important to elect women voted for Republicans 84 13, I think. Yeah. So that to me gets to what, what I think is the core issue here, which is there is a large gap between the preferences and views of the Republican rank and file and the Republican elite. Not just on this, by the way, but on everything. The whole reason that Donald Trump became the nominee is because the party thought that their voters cared about deficits, free trade, um, spending, and entitlement reform. Guess what? That They weren't motivated by that stuff. That was the province of party elites. And that's the reason that we got Trump, because Trump spoke to what the party did care about, which was immigration, uh, immigration uh, the perception that Democrats are overly PC, the, per the perception that, that America is going to hell in a handbasket for reasons that are barely veiled about race and gender. Um, and I think that's part of the challenge that the, the GOP has. The elites recognize the problem. The voters don't give a damn. And in fact, the voters are driven, in fact, by the opposite view. They're driven by the fact that they think the Democrats are increasingly consumed with identity politics and that they're going to be the opposite of that. And so when, when the GOP starts to sort of do a similar thing, they don't necessarily like it, or at least they don't care about it that much, because to them, that's what the other side is doing. And I think that as Republicans have become more of a party that's oppositional to what they perceive as the, the Democrats are, it's gotten harder to pursue these kind of diversity measures, because the entire point now of being a Republican is not about supporting small government or free trade or, or, or less spending. It's become more about opposing what they perceive as the other side is. And a lot of that is wrapped up in identity politics. Um, the second thing I was going to mention is... Identity, so the, I think that's an interesting point, but what do you mean? But Are you talking about white identity? Yeah. As the Republicans see Democrats as becoming more wrapped up in their identity politics, the Republicans are becoming more consumed with their own identity politics. Right. Um, and that is, yes, white identity politics. Yeah. Exactly. And so while, while the elites, the Stephonics of the world say, oh, shit, this looks terrible, we got to fix this, the actual voters in the Republican Party are saying, no, the whole reason I, I'm voting for you guys is because you, you aren't that, you know? Um, they're not uh, in it for less spending. There's, and, there's a lot of jumps you're making there. There's a lot of jumps. I mean, Donald Trump is, is, is the president of the United States. And Marco Rubio, Ted Cruz, Tim Scott are senators in the U.S. Senate. So and they all lost yeah. the, the race for president. Uh, yeah, but it, it was all because the they were candidates of color. The core of Trump's appeal was the fact he was speaking to the Republican grassroots in a way that the party elites weren't. It turns out that Paul Ryanism wasn't selling among the actual party. That was a sort of plaything for elites and for donors. The actual voters wanted grievance politics. They were in for saying, "We're going to say Christmas again, goddammit. it!" That's not. It, you're missing the whole movement. The whole Tea Party movement does not come out of grievance politics. I couldn't disagree more. Why did, why did the U.S. have four wave elections in five cycles where a body of, of Congress switched hands? Is because they kept saying, Coke, Pepsi, Coke, Pepsi. Tea Party comes out of that because no one's fighting for me, is what they're saying, because of the elites, and I'll give you that yeah. point. But don't sit there and tell me that Trump, Trump came out of this grievance politics because what he did, he built a national message with a national campaign. While everyone else was check, checking boxes, right. hey, I want to talk to you about this. And right. this. He, he built a national movement. But he wasn't talking about deficits and entitlement reform <clears throat> and free trade, Rob. You're he was right. talking he was about, talking we're going to say Merry Christmas again. The immigrants are coming over the border. We're going to ban Muslims. And by the way, I'm sick of being PC in this country. 
Because well, I don't know like, how he, I can't speak to how he comes to decisions, but you look at you look at the hollowing out of the communities that the jobs are leaving, the drugs are coming in, right? Um, and I'm, we got to blame somebody for it. I mean, I, look, but it was my, it was it was brilliant politically, right? But my point is, and and, and what, what I think people forget is, like, they look at immigration, they look at the trade wars as two separate things. Oh, that goes to judiciary committee. This goes to Senate yeah. finance. And these, to your average voter, these are the same issues. Someone's fighting for me. So they, they tried Coke, they tried Pepsi, and they chose bleach. And they're hoping bleach works. That's, I think, what happened here, is that it was a rejection of the party elites. And, and well, uh, is that what he's saying? Because bleach was offering what they actually wanted. Exactly. They didn't want Coke or Pepsi. Exactly. That's my point, is that, is that the American electorate what I'm writ large was swinging back and forth between Democrats and Republicans, and Trump comes out, and he and I think the polling would hold out that he wasn't heavily identified as a Republican. Okay, let, let me jump in and throw Rob a lifeline here, believe it or no, not. Please don't. Okay? <laughs> and it has to do with your newspaper. And this was oh, a dynamic. Man. No, no. Everyone, Wait a second. I'm going to compliment the paper for a second. I criticize... I criticize public polling all the time, and I think newspapers have a horse race obsession that is so detrimental to the conversation. But on September, September 16th, uh, 2016, the New York Times reported on a poll, and the headline of that poll said, voters see Trump as risk, but may be worth it. Yeah. And the dynamic that everybody missed in that election, and Rob, I think you're probably right about something here, and that's why I say it's a little bit of a lifeline. They saw him, they were sick of the establishment in Washington, and they saw him as someone who would blow up the establishment, and I think that's beyond identity politics. I think there's an element here of Washington being broken, and Trump in a very anti-establishment moment, which, by the way, we're seeing in every Western democracy right now. And that is what put him over the top in a very narrow election. He was not elected with a mandate, let's be clear, right? This was not, you know, 380 electoral votes. He gets by, like Bush did in his first term, uh, through the Electoral College with a, a, Bush only lost the popular vote by 500. You know, here he loses it by 3 million. So I think we're wrapping too much into what was going on and the fact that we are, everybody, Democrats and Republicans in this country believe the establishment is failing them. And right now, with Donald Trump's hands on the rudder, by the way, they paid a price, the Republicans paid a price in the midterms because he hasn't blown up I agree with that. the establishment and cleaned but, the swamp. But, Joel, I, mean, I don't think that a general election voter's reluctant preference for the outsider because they're fed up with Washington changes what I said, which is the fact that the Republican elites were giving their voters something that their voters didn't want, and Trump came along and gave them what they actually wanted. Like... Those two things aren't, to me, in conflict. I mean, I would agree, but we've seen that. I mean, Eric Cantor lost his election, and it had everything to do with the fact that he was the elite, and he was Washington, and he, he was what was broken. The Republicans rejected yeah. that. I mean, th there's a point when yeah, you... Yeah, I agree with it. It wasn't just I mean, Trump. I think you look at Trump polling and you look at Republican Senate polling, and they're not, there's not a correlation other than... Right track wrong yeah, to and Luger and Bob Bennett lost their races. But, to, yeah, sure. But my point is, is that independent voters tr are not seeing; they're seeing Trump and Republicans. Yeah. And so while there's, uh, you know, I, I saw some polling on Trump, Obama Trump voters, and they're sticking with Trump. And when they ask the secondary question, who do you give credit for your reason for supporting Trump? They don't say the Republican Party. They right. say a pox on both their houses, Democrat Republican, and I'm with Trump. Yes. I mean, there's almost like a separation, as Trump would like to say, the brand has separated from the party. And that's why, you know, I, I think there was a lot of things in that election. Holding the White House for three terms by any party is really tough. Yeah, I agree with that. Really tough. Do you have, a closing, do you have a closing thought yeah, on, do, gender, on gender? <laughs> yes, gender. that was my other point that I was going to make. Topic of the panel. Yes, but, Thank but God we, we have a moderator. Yeah. We've gotten wrapped up now. Closing thought on gender. Please. Yes, I do. Go. Go. Thank you. Ten seconds. The, yeah. Yes, the first woman elected governor in her own right, not the widow or the, um, the wife of a governor. This is going to blow you away. 1974, Ella Grasso. It was not until 74, a woman won. What state? Right be, uh, Connecticut. 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 So that shows you how tough it has been for women to be like the governor. This is a sort of fascination of mine. Uh, and I think uh, Kiki made a point about um, how women in campaigns are pushed into the comms role. Well, oftentimes what happens in state politics is that women are shunted into the LG role. 
because the LG role is seen as a good supplementary position. It balances a ticket. It can create a sort of more gentle perceived phase for TV <coughs> ads and lit to have a woman on the ticket. We see it all the time. The problem with that is that the LG role is not a good launching pad to become governor because it's not an executive role. If you look at the women who have become governor in American history, invariably they were secretaries of state, treasurers, insurance commissioners, attorneys general, or speakers of the state house or Senate leaders because they had a previous executive experience right. and that propelled them to become Not as like a wingman for something. Yes, as possible governors. The problem is that they're so often made LGs and that never gets them to the final. And Kiki mentioned the, the 2000s, Chris, Chris Gregoire, um, Jim Napolitano, Jennifer Granholm, they were all state AGs beforehand. And um, I think- It was new that AGs broke through finally. Secretary yeah. of State Treasurer's had better. Yeah. Until the 2000s. So I uh, think that's key is getting women in roles of the constitutional offices, especially AG, before they become governors. Okay. Well, right. on that closing note, thank you, NYU. Thank you to the great panel. And <laughs> see you soon.